even Freddie, like I don't want him in my brain every time. Like I'm in a hotel <laughs> sitting, like I have a room next to the elevator and I hear that. I don't know why, but I always think Freddy Krueger's in that elevator coming to get me. Like, really? it's the first thought I have. And whenever I get in the bathtub, the first thought oh, I have is like, God, sure. oh, the bathtub scene, here we go again. But it's like a <laughs> yeah. laugh in my brain, but it's not uh, a laugh. Yeah. It's like forever when I take a bath, I will always think of Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Welcome to Scream Dreams, the nightmares that shaped us, where we sit down with your favorite filmmakers and creatives and talk about their nightmares and the things that really terrify them. I'm Catherine Corcoran. And I'm James A. Janice. And today we are joined by such an amazing actress, creative extraordinaire, who whose first credit was nightmare related. Heather Lankenkamp, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. I'm really, I love this topic. And of course, my whole career has been centered around dreams so this is right up my alley thank you for inviting me yeah you are the dream guest literally. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's true i mean did how ha, how i'm sure you really thought about nightmares then since it's such a part of your life is it kind of annoying to have to talk about them do you always get asked questions about your nightmares almost in every like autograph signing that i go to someone will ask me about the the kind of nightmares that i have uh -huh. but i have to say before i did nightmare on elm street i didn't really think about nightmares that often i didn't have a lot of nightmares as a child yeah. though i did have a couple of you know absolutely terrifying nightmares um when i was young and then when i met wes craven you know a lot of the times when we were working i would say wes you know, help me out here. I, I don't really understand, like, what's happening. Like, this doesn't make logical sense to me. Like, why is Nancy doing this? And I'd ask him, like, really practical, logical questions. And he's like, Heather, this is a dream. And so it became kind of our code word for, like, stop worrying so much and just, like, do what I'm asking you to do. <laughs> and and so that started out kind of as a joke. You know, we just, he would, he, he didn't want to like sit down and explain to me something for, you know, a, a, a technical question about why is Nancy, you know, running so slowly or something like that. He would always yeah. say, this is just a dream. Um, getting back to the idea of nightmares, I think what I've realized is our, our subconscious is actually like such a um, delicate and really powerful thing for us to, you know, have our own mental health and also to have creativity like pure yeah. creativity and he really benefit from tapping into it and I I feel like Wes Craven was like a really good example of it um so the one dream that I've had several times and I actually told Greg Nicotero about it just a few months ago when we were in Florida at Spooky yeah. Empire. Mm -hmm. Were you at Spooky Empire? No, no, I wasn't. But I so many of I think there was like a lot of cosplays of me at that one. So everyone <laughs> was like sending things like No, no, everyone like... is playing you now, so <laughs> just get used to that. But um Greg Nicotero, who did the makeup effects for Wes Craven's New Nightmare, he was sitting maybe five tables over from me and I, I looked at him and we smiled a couple times and then he came over and um and we were just talking and I said, I probably never told you about the nightmare that you're in, in, in my in my nightmare. And he's like, no, you've never told me. And I said, well, for many years, I had this nightmare where that tongue was wrapped around my head and that my husband would tell me that I would sleepwalk to the fireplace and be like grabbing oh. at it, trying to take it off my face and trying to get rid of it and, you know, kind of screaming and like get this thing off of me and... Um, and he's like, you're kidding me. And, you know, Greg Nicotero was like shocked that <laughs> that I would have had any kind of effect from just a silly makeup effect on a set. Yeah. And I said, it's really deep in my brain. And um, and I said, I think I was very humiliated that day when we did that shot. I think that it really affected my psyche in a way that I'm trying to get it out of me. But whenever I've talked about it, I just get overcome with the feelings of like, embarrassment and yeah. humiliation and um, I feel very like be not belittled but just like a woman a grown woman with a giant phallic symbol like wrapped around her head six or seven times you know and and on the set the 
the makeup effects people who God bless them. You yeah. know, I know them all and they're all friends of mine. They're like, more KY, let's loop this guy <laughs> yeah. up. You know, like all these jokes that mm -hmm. in their mind, it was lightening the mood and everybody was smiling. Yeah. I mean, I was smiling and laughing too. And yeah. I, and it, I, I don't want to put this on them at all because it's just the environment that yeah. we all live on on a set. It's, it's fun and we make jokes, yeah. but you know, just, talking about the sensitivity of our own subconscious mind mm -hmm. is that there was something that happened that day that just went really deep. And so the sense of like being humiliated by like this sexual encounter with that Freddie tongue yeah. Yeah. was, and I really understood for the first time, like the shame that women feel when they have anything like that that happens. It can be like, you know, maybe they just get slapped on the butt or maybe, mm -hmm. but it can have like a really serious effect on you. And so I realized when I had that dream and when my husband, with you know, David Anderson, he's like, that's really scary, Heather. I, I, you know, we really need to figure out like how you can stop having that dream. And, you know, it's taken. You were actually sleepwalking? Yeah, I actually was sleepwalking like in the house, like thinking... going to the because we have like a little fireplace yeah. in the corner of our bedroom. And oh, okay. um, wow. so I realized that that, you know, that was how many years ago, like 30 years yeah. ago, um, that I had to be really careful about like, not only things that happened to me, but just things that I put in my brain because anything can cause that kind of, um, it's, it's kind of like a little tiny trauma, you know, it's yeah. like a little bit of, mental anguish that you have to somehow get out of your system and so I feel like today I have because I you know you know I don't ever have that dream again and I certainly yeah. have processed that moment in my life but when I told Greg Nicotero I actually kind of regretted it because he took it really hard mm. oh. and um it showed me like what a kind person he yeah. is deep down because yeah. he was like you know we do all these things to people and we do a lot of things to women on a set that we all are okay with it because we're all giving consent and we're all yeah. like, and it's very intimate. You're working really closely with people. But he's like, I never really thought that an actor would take it away and like live with it. Yeah. And it's, um, it's such an interesting thing that you bring up because like, we, I don't even think we realize sometimes that we carry it, you know, like, even when you're with amazing people and amazing crews and everyone right. that you love, you know, it's our job as storytellers to kind of take these things on and become, as actors really, to become vessels for the story. And you don't always realize in the moment because you're just doing your job and the adrenaline is so high and you're like, okay, I have to hit this, especially when you're dealing with like crazy effects like that. You just kind of don't realize what you carry with you until afterwards. And you've kind of unlocked something for me like, when I was earlier in my career, um, I was just like very, I had done some roles that were like very hypersexualized very early on. And I didn't think about how they would impact me really later. It's just like, well, I want to work and I'm an actor and this is, this is the job. But I kept having this like anxiety and feeling like I had to prove my intelligence or prove that I was, uh, uh, that I could do other things. And it's something I still carry, but for a long time I had this reoccurring nightmare that I was behind like a, a glass wall and I could see everybody on, on a set or even sometimes it would be like my family and I was banging on the wall and nobody could see me and nobody could hear me oh. for hours. Like I, I was just stuck in there, like, but I could right. see them, but they couldn't see me. And it was like, right. I never knew what, like, you just maybe unlocked that maybe that was like a manifestation of that, like, early, because all around that time, like, early on, just being like, I just don't think people see me. Yeah. You know? No, I mean, it's, being an actor, I mean, I mean you're really, like, I mean, this is why a lot of actors go to therapy. <laughs> yeah, it's always <laughs> I mean, advice. I don't go, I don't go to therapy as a, you know, as a habit, but, yeah. um, not as a habit, but as a regular thing. Yeah. But I do feel that because if you're really trying to be a good actor, you're opening up like your heart yeah. and you're opening up your brain and your subconscious to actually react to everything that yeah. you see around you. Yeah. And to give the best reactions, you know, it has to go deep, you know. Um, and a lot of the times when you're trying to coach somebody who's, you know, just beginning or like it's somebody who wants to have a deeper kind of uh, reality when they're yeah. in the acting, their acting world, 
it's like you just try to keep opening up all the locks like in their bodies like what's keeping you from crying what's keeping yeah. you from you know feeling the joy or or whatever yeah. it is why are you looking stiff it's because you're you're blocking or you're locking yeah. something up and so as an actor you're constantly like opening it up opening it up and yeah. and it makes you very vulnerable and and that vulnerability is it's the hardest part of being an actor. You know, it's why, like, it, it's really hard to, like, put up those walls because, you know, the minute you start putting up walls, oh, that's going to that's gonna work against me the next yeah. time I have to play a part. You know, I, like, and so when you live in a place like L.A. Mm-hmm. And uh, have, I was just telling you earlier, yeah. like, there was a SWAT team in front of me, like, half an hour ago, so, like, with so machine crazy. guns and crazy weapons. And I just, I, it almost was, like, they were after me. Like, I just felt yeah. so scared. Yeah. And it was very terrifying to see that that's how, like, how law enforcement, like, takes care of business. And, and it's just never been in my front yard yeah. like that. You know, I just, yeah. I never really thought about it until today. And, um, but, you know, you open yourself up and as a result, things hit you really hard. And, yeah. um, but, yeah, getting back to nightmares, I do think that the the thing that, lately I've been really you know like Wes I'm like really trying to control like what happens in my dreams so um I'll get in a situation in the dream where I have a conscious thought like I do not like the way this dream is going like this is scaring me yeah and it's, sometimes it's it's like it's like the movie Hitchhiker or you know where there's just like a weird person you know and yeah. they're giving you following you or you know you're just having this weird following dream and I'll say I really want to wake up and so in my my conscious mind is like in there saying this is not a fun dream I want to wake up and what Wes would tell what Wes told me to do instead of just telling yourself to wake up which is kind of a lucid dreaming technique Mm -hmm. you say okay what can I do right now in this dream to make the whole thing flip around and so that I'm the one in control or so you can fly away you can like develop a weapon for a hand or you know you can yeah. think of a billion ways from your video games like yeah. how you can be the conqueror in, the, in yeah. your own dream and, or just escape or just like burrow a hole to the other side of the earth or something like that yeah and you know Wes is so creative that I'm sure he was doing crazy stuff like that to <laughs> make his that. yeah you know, to make his dream where he was, you know, the powerful victor or whatever, yeah. whatever he wanted the outcome to be, he would able to, to manifest that. And and I've never been able to really do it that effectively, but maybe once I I did fly away from a dangerous situation. I was like in the Grand Canyon traversing that little tiny trail that's like so thin, like barely yeah. one foot wide. And I was about to fall off and I was just like, okay, let's just jump. And then Boo, you know, flying around, and that happened. It was so you fast. You actually flew in your dream? Just in one time, yeah. I did it. What did it And it was like? so great. It was so amazing. And I woke up after that dream and just was really totally excited. Like, just thought, you can fly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really master this. But then it never has really happened to that degree again. And mm-hmm. so it's just something that, you know, it's 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 fun, it's fun to think about doing and. But you do have to start, like, getting more sleep. I think that's the first thing you've got to do. Did you feel like wind? (laughs) You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, you really feel like you're a bird, you know. And that's one of the things I've always wanted to be as a bird. (laughs) So, (laughs) like, just that idea of having that kind of freedom of movement that uh, I've always wanted that. So that was, like, a truly victorious dream. I don't – what's the opposite of a nightmare? Like a – uh, like a, a dream. I mean, <laughs> a bit like a great, like a great dream, dream, like yeah. a great I, is dream. Is there like, an adjective for it? I don't know. I don't know. We should like come a, up with one. Like a, it's should not a hallucination. That. It's like a something else, but it's euphoric like a dream. euphoric mm-hmm. dream. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say a euphoric yeah. dream. Yeah, we had a we had a guest on. I think his episode will have aired by the time yours does. If it doesn't, or if it has, they should go back and watch it. If it hasn't, it's this little sneak peek of what's coming. But he called it um, free money. Is what he called that. So he writes down his dreams. 
And he talked about how some of the characters in his work come directly from his dreams. And one in particular that was from a nightmare. And he calls that free money. Yeah. Because he said people pay a lot of money to be scared like that or yeah. to feel those that happen to those things. And you you are able to in such a amazing way. Like you can fly these these nightmares yeah. type things. Have you ever thought about incorporating them into your own Kind of. Well, I mean, it, it. you know, the truth is, is that, and people know this about me, is that um, when I watch horror movies, it it is really hard on my psyche mm. for a yeah. long time. I physically feel, a, I physically really feel a lot of the fear that is being presented to me on screen. Yeah. Still In a to way, this day, you still feel that yeah, way? I mean, I really feel like, of... yeah. yeah, I really feel terrified by certain things that I've scene and so I am very like I really ask like a lot of people's opinions before I see a movie like wow. okay like what is the grossest thing in the movie like <laughs> okay like know. how much blood is in it and like is it really violent or just kind of violent like is it is it breaking taboos that like we all are holding yeah like our society together like your movie actually breaks some taboos I think yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> that that um are, you know, I wonder sometimes, because we did work on American Horror Story for six years, yeah. mm -hmm. and every time I got a script that broke a taboo, I'd be like, that one's that one's now broken. Like, it's, yeah. and things that hold society together, like taboos, like, I think we, we wreck them too easily sometimes. Like, I'm not sure yeah. what kind of effect it will have on our society over time, but, um, I mean, there's a reason that they exist. Like, we don't do this to babies, like, mm. on yeah, screen, yeah. right? Like, that's a taboo that still hasn't been broken that much, maybe once in a while. Yeah. But um, we don't, like, it, it used to be, like, you don't show children in peril. Like, that mm -hmm. used to be not okay. only a taboo, but it was something that the rating system, if you showed a child in peril, X, yeah. you would, you know, X rated immediately in Nightmare 7. Wes Craven's new nightmare, like he had built into the movie many really objectionable scenes when he cut it together that he knew, like there's a negotiation between the ratings board. Like, because yeah. he knew he wanted to show Dylan in peril. Mm -hmm. he, they, he wanted to have all those scenes with Dylan being chased by Freddy, getting the knife, yeah. like going into the, and and jumping off that play structure. Yeah. Right. That he had to, incorporate in the movie like some really like no go x rated yeah uh not necessarily sexual but mm -hmm. just horror related x rated stuff so that he could have this negotiation okay we'll cut out this scene if we can keep this one it's interesting that you bring this up because it's something that i i struggle with ethically like what our responsibility is in this genre to to talk about this and to and like where the line is between like going there because like that's what genre does right it tackles hard topics and that's what's so incredible about it but also like the line between that and then gore for gore's sake you know I don't and I, it's something like ethically that I I struggle with finding that balance and I I because and and obviously there are films where you know we all watch them where we're like uh I don't know. That was too much. I, I didn't like that. But I don't know as a if it's supposed to feel that way and we're supposed to. Society. I think it's supposed yeah. to. Yeah. I you mean, know? and then bringing that idea because I feel exactly the same way as you yeah. do um, is that I also know now that that thing that you went, uh, I don't know if I wanted to see that, that that thing I don't want in my brain. I just don't. I, yeah. I don't. I don't want to ever have to think about it again. And um, because I have I have too many, like, images of things in my brain from before, like right. before today, that I cannot get rid of. Like, ugh, it's yeah. just sitting there, like, torturing me at night when I'm by myself. Or, like, even Freddie. Like, I don't want him in my brain every time. <laughs> like, I'm in a hotel sitting. Like, I have a room next to the elevator, and I hear that, Ugh. I don't know why, but I always think Freddy Krueger's in that elevator coming to get me. Like, really? it's the first thought I have. And whenever I get in the bathtub, the first thought oh, I have is like, God, sure. oh, the bathtub scene. Here we go again. But it's like a <laughs> yeah. laugh in my brain, but it's not uh, a laugh. Yeah. It's like forever when I take a bath, I will always think of Freddy Krueger. Wow. And I, 
it's a tiny little 1% of my, like less than 1% of my concern. Mm -hmm. But the fact that that's what I always think about when I get into a bathtub, I'm not thinking about like, oh, look at the bath bomb I bought. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> I can't wait to smell like, oh, yeah. what is it going to smell like in there? And like, oh, I'm going to light a candle. It's always like, hey, I'm going into the Freddy place, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and so even that, giving that much to the horror world is too much for me, you know? Yeah. It's like, I think like, oh, I just, uh, I'm such a scaredy cat. Yeah, and it sounds know? like you're also a very visual thinker. Do you, yeah. do you yeah. see vivid I'm, I'm images always, yeah. in your, your mind? Always, yeah, I mean, and like now whenever I see a clown, I think of Twisty the Clown. Or <laughs> whenever I see, um, you know, an old dilapidated hotel, I think of, I think of, um, the addiction demon coming out of the bed. You know, it's yeah. like I have a lot of visions from American Horror Story that are really, really violent and yeah. horrible. And so I think like when I'm thinking about going to see a horror movie, I think, okay, do I need more of this in my brain? Like if it's really important movie to see, I will see it and um, and I'll just add those those visions go into the little catalog of other horrible yeah. things in my brain and filing cabinet, you know, they're in there yeah. and I have accepted them and I appreciate them, but yeah. I just don't want to have them like the folks who can't like every weekend have to see four or five like different horror movies like James over there. <laughs> like, I just couldn't be that person. It would just I don't think I could have like a normal life if I did. Well, I heard Barbara might be busy today. To no, 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 no. We need our side Barb. Hey, 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 true. Why don't we conjure her oh. with our little Freddie song? Oh, that's okay. a great idea. Yeah. Do you want right. to start us off? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One, One, two, Barbara's coming for you. Three, four, better lock the door. Five, six, grab your crucifix. Seven, eight, gonna stay up late. Nine, ten, never sleep again. Oh my God, you guys, I I was having lunch and it was so delicious. And all of a sudden, I felt like I had to be here and it got conjured up. Yeah, Oh my you. God, so thank we you for doing that. <laughs> it's good to see so good you. To see oh my you. God. Oh. You know, we have this little girls group now kind of that <laughs> yeah. we've had for many years but it's we're, we're not, formally like acknowledging it now we're formally acknowledging it do you have a name it. for like, it uh, they have a chat that's the next step you know we actually it was too. Bria yeah. Grant years ago mm -hmm. that kind of started it although I hadn't Mick Garris you know had the Masters of Horror yeah and he got all the directors together to kind of have a group where they could talk about what they were doing and you know, just sort of have a support group yeah. for directors. And I thought that was a good idea years ago. And I talked to Bria about it. And then Bria, like, yeah, we're going to do this, Barbara. And she kind of took over. <laughs> and she said, okay, I'm going to invite this person, this person, this person. And we're going to have the older crowd and the younger crowd. Uh -huh. And I was like, great. So I was living in San Francisco at the time. And we put on a couple of events with the ladies when I would come down to uh -huh. L.A. And then you know, it sort of fell off a little bit and then COVID happened. And since I've moved back to Los Angeles and I've been here almost two years now, yeah. uh, we've been doing it a little more regularly and other people have come. Actually, Diane Franklin then right. started her own thing. She's like, well, I I'm starting a girls group and we're, well, she first started it with a text thread that we were on we were all on um, a text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we all, a bunch of us, maybe 12 of us are you on You get a like text. 27 texts a day. <laughs> we get a lot. We get a lot of when something is happening. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Like the strike and all of that. Like so many texts. Yeah. So you and I <laughs> yeah. are on it and Diane and Judy Aronson and Bonnie Aronson yeah. and Jennifer Tilly's on it yeah. and a few other people. And so we just, we offer support to one another. And wish happy birthday to each other. And we wish happy birthday. <laughs> yes. Lots of birthday And wishes. Laura Cayude is on it. She lives in... Um, in Atlanta and you know there's a lot of different people on it and then there's only so many people we can add on our chat mm -hmm. so then we tried to do Facebook it Messenger and it wasn't really yeah. working and so anyway Diane then said okay we're all getting together we're all gonna meet yeah. and we're gonna do this so so we've gotten together a few times yeah. in real I've life and a couple times at my house yeah. 
uh, over the summer we did, and then we got together at Judy's house. You came to that, didn't you? No, I was oh, no, out of town, come. but Chelsea, Chelsea went to that. Chelsea came. Yeah. Honestly, mm -hmm. it's yeah. it's the first time, and I, I, I'm so grateful to you ladies because come. I recently moved to LA, and I didn't really... I didn't really know, like, I kind of felt a little out of place and it was, I didn't really feel like I found my community and like my people until I started doing Aww. these like girls. Groups. Girls events. Yeah. Yes, and it was because yes. Barbara invited me. Like it just, it, it, it makes such a difference to have just people who understand exactly what you're going through and yeah. exactly what you're doing. I, I just think, yeah, we need a place to bounce thoughts off you know each yeah. other and what we're all going through and yeah. creatively personally whatever so but also to learn how to talk again don't you feel <laughs> yeah. like after the pandemic yeah. Yes. Yeah. like i oh, went to a, a little my manager had a party last night and i really felt like my conversation skills were at a zero level oh, no. i mean i mean you're i've been so blabbing good. all day yeah. right no <laughs> but you're so good and i've heard you on other podcast you're no. a very good speaker. I could You're not make a conversation. Yourself. Maybe it wasn't just me, but oh. I would start a conversation. Where are you from? And then it'd be like, Detroit. And then oh. it'd be like, it was like nobody. nobody Maybe it was them. It wasn't there. you. It was no, them. it was both of us. Like we oh. both were so like embarrassed to open up, you know, yeah. whereas I know you guys, I've known you forever. Yeah. Like, we feel so comfortable and. But when you're with strangers, it's yeah. such right. a good skill to learn. Yeah. So that's why I think your yeah. events were so helpful yeah. to people who needed to, you know, just meet people. Yeah, just meet people. And I want to do one. Um, uh, we're taping this before the Christmas holiday, but I want to try to do one for the Christmas holiday yeah. oh, nice. if we can fit it in. But otherwise, we'll do one um, in the new year, another one. But um, I just want to say, as I've grown older I really appreciate the company of women and the company of people that are in our business not to say I don't love hanging out yeah, with you I'm good. and I've been to your house a few times and you throw some you awesome parties that. right yeah um but I really just appreciate uh, just being with other women and we all have been through a lot of the same things and you know in the beginning of your conversation you guys were talking about and I've heard you talk about this on uh, some other of our shows about being exploited in the business and you know I mean I certainly went through that mm -hmm. you know when I was younger and I, don't, I, I, I feel fine about it you yeah. know I was but um, but I also had really great parts that were really smart women yeah. as well so it was fine um, but there's a lot of and there's more to that we're not going to go into but yeah um, I just feel really embraced by women as we've gotten older and yeah. we just we just all want to help one another and just be friends yeah. with one another. And, you know, I've gotten to know you better. I knew you from acting class, from Daryl Hickman's oh acting class. Oh, my God, I know. 30 <laughs> Don't you think of Daryl years ago. all the time? We had the oh, best yes. acting teacher in the whole we world. We did. And you had just done uh, your first movie, Maybe I think. Maybe I had just. And then, you, and then you came to class and we were all in awe of you. We were like, really? Ooh, Heather Langenkamp is here. Oh my gosh. I had um, no concept of that at all. I was no, so intimidated. No, we were all like, Heather. Oh, okay. Well, that just goes to show you we all feel that because, right. yeah. because we were intimidated by you because we're like, oh, this huge movie star is coming to our class. Oh my and gosh. That's what we I, thought about you. the first I've ever heard of this. <laughs> wow. And then I think we had like Joe DiMaggio's wife was also in our class. Yeah, and there was some unique There was some folks. really, yeah. and one of the guys who, uh, Jeff Conway, who was on Taxi. Oh, and Dan uh, Fleischman. Uh, Dan no. Fleischman? No, was, Who's that? Oh, he was on Head of the Class. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, was that his name? am I getting his name wrong? Dan is his first name for sure. Oh, somebody he's a big director up. now. I'm like spacing <laughs> oh on God. his name. Um, yeah, he was He was my scene partner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This this is all fascinating too, but um, we have to get to our little segment. Okay, let's get to our segment. Sidebar. Oh. <laughs> You know what's a nightmare? Dehydration. Yeah. You know what's an even worse nightmare? Plastic pollution. That's why we love Liquid Death and their evil mission to murder your thirst and kill plastic pollution. That's right. Their aluminum cans are as metal as they get. So <laughs> pick some up today because we all need something uh, refreshing to reach for when we wake up from a nightmare. It's true. Cheers. <laughs> So, uh, uh, Catherine and Bob Portal, our producer, frequently come up with these games that we play with our guests. Okay. And, you know, we try to shake it up. It's a little bit different. Sometimes we do a Mad Lib or we, mm. with you and Chelsea, we did the um, Newlywed game. Mm -hmm. um, this is called 
and you help me if I'm not saying it okay. right foot because you created this. Escape the nightmare, mm. oh, which you're very good you. at. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're oh, right. I this is, think I know what this might be. And yeah. Okay. And so I'm going to create a scenario <laughs> for you that you have to escape from. Okay. Escape. And then what? Yeah, you looked at it. Sorry. <laughs> bad kids in the corner okay. um so i'm going to describe a terrifying and vivid nightmare which the guests must escape from mm. and then okay. you're going to try to escape you know from that uh get out of it from that one thing but then uh an gonna... another host is going to create another boundary oh. or oh, obstacle no. for yeah. you and then uh you'll have to get out of that and then uh, James will okay. say something. Just gonna pile then, on. Pile yeah. on. This and is then, a nightmare. And then at some point, if we feel like you've escaped, <laughs> we'll let you out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Or you. Now, I mean, can I? Do, do, do I have to be bounded by any human capabilities or? Oh, well, that I. I I, I don't know. I know it's a brass. This is like. No, I think you can. Well, listen. Well, I mean, are we a video logic, game right? or are we yeah. like yeah. reality? We could add, we could add I, things. No, I think okay. you should go with your instinct. Okay, yeah. I'll just go with my instinct whenever be it comes Be a lucid up. dreamer. No, I'll be my I lucid think dreamer. You're, yeah. Because actually, you're the professional. Yeah. It's okay, true. Like know? on and multiple and levels. As yes. We right. Okay, let's see. So, okay. So here we are. I actually didn't prepare for this. Oh. Um, are you going to act it out? What? You're not acting it out. She's going to get up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it was also. a dark and stormy night. Um, I'm going to put us on a farm. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay, is that okay? You want to I got to visualize my farm here. Okay, got it. Okay, farm. <laughs> and the interesting, interesting thing about this farm is that it's about, you know, maybe two acres of land, small farm, small house. Mm. And... Uh, there's barbed wire all around it, like a big chain link, link fence and barbed wire uh, on top. And you would think at a farmhouse there'd be a lot of tools and everything, and there are, but all of the the barn door and the closets and and things that are in the house, every everywhere where you would have tools, the drawers, they're all um, locked and closed and there's nobody around but you mm. and you have to somehow escape or get out of this um get out of this farm enclosure <laughs> good luck pretty good luck. well on our farm <laughs> you could always pull the the barbed wire apart from each other and like throw one leg in and then slide your back and then throw the other leg out and you could kind of very shimmy through the different barbed wires. Okay, but you have a chain link fence and the barbed wire oh, on top. Oh, 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 that kind of barbed wire. Okay, so, so that what I like do is I, yeah. I go to the tree. <laughs> that's, far. There's a tree in the corner <laughs> that you didn't mention. Ooh. And I pull off the lowest hanging branch that's dead. <laughs> and I make it into a catapult, you know, like a, you know, what is it called? You, Long slingshot. Dip. No, the, what do you do? Like you yeah, post the, it. The running javelin. Yeah, the javelin. Oh, yeah. Very good. Okay. It's not really the javelin that no, you throw. It's like you the... post it in the ground and you leap yourself over the mm -hmm. fence. Okay. But as you are going to do that, you're you have a, a a heavy sweater on and it gets caught in the barbed wire and you are then hanging on the fence in the barbed wire and you can't really move because. Right. You're hanging. So I it. just shimmy out of my sweater. Unfortunately, I'm, not, I'm just in my underwear. <laughs> but I shimmy out of my sweater <laughs> and I fall to the ground on the other side. Uh, so <laughs> you're on the other side of this fence. It's it's to your back. And unfortunately, uh, your neighbor's farm. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Who's yes. not my friend? Actually. Not your friend at all, and is a is a bull farmer. Uh, they their their farm is just full of bulls, just very angry, uh, masculine just bulls. Right, right. And uh, the the underwear you're wearing happens to be red, and so these bulls uh, oh catch it out of the corner of their That's eye. And, they're ready, and they're ready. They're their horns are down. They're, they're charging at you. You got the fence behind you. 
And you got a, a big bowl coming well, at you. <laughs> little did you know that I studied a very special kind of music in Spain. Ooh. And it's <laughs> we'd learn songs to put bulls to sleep. Mm. So I remember this song that I learned in Spain, and I start singing it as it's approaching, about to gore me. But as it gets closer and hears the song, then it's kind of lulled to sleep, and it just kind of stops and falls down right there in front of me. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let you out. <laughs> <laughs> Good job! That was too easy. No. <laughs> He's saying a bowl to sleep. That's, that's yeah. Great. It's you are the professional. It's yeah. true. After all you've been through, I'm letting you out. Oh, you know? so Come on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm taking care of I you. I think it was just going so yeah. far off the rails that you just decided to save me from it. No, us, us girls have to stick together. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Anyway, this has been really fun, and I know you have a lot more to discuss. So and you have a lunch to finish. I'm getting back to my lunch. Yeah. Enjoy. See you later. Oh. Oh. At least we got her. I know. Yeah. It, it was. I, it was all because we we sang the song. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> what what like actually scares you in your day to day then? So obviously like horror movies definitely scare you, which is <laughs> funny because we usually get the opposite response. Where people are like ah, it takes a lot to get me at this point, you know. But oh what no, you... I mean I look at all that stuff is totally real and happening like <laughs> yeah. at that moment. Like yeah. I think it's totally real. Like it's uh, my suspension of disbelief is like. I'm a great, you know, I'll watch it as if I'm like a five-year-old for the first time. <laughs> yeah. I, um, but if a movie's really bad, though, like if it's a really bad horror movie, like I can sit back and go, oh, my gosh, and roll my eyes. But for a good one, and today they're all pretty, they're, they're pretty so good. good. Yeah. yeah. They're so good. And can you think of a the effects one? are really good. Can what? you think of a recent one you've seen that, yeah, that's, that's like really you. stuck with you? That you oh, well, I mean, I haven't it? seen all of Terrifier, but um, – <laughs> I mean, just the things that I've seen of Terrifier will always stay with me. How do you yeah. process like all of the, the content that you are absorbing? So like you're because I feel like it, it, we're like in this nice little like spectrum here. Where I'm like kind of dead center between <laughs> the two of you in terms of like what I consume. With the amount of horror yeah, you consume. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It just doesn't. Uh, it, it's just such an artifice to me. I, I, I it's hard for me to. Even if in the moment I'm absorbed and really enjoying the story and the performances and I'm feeling those emotions, as soon as the movie's over, uh, and it's probably just due to the nature of my work, I have to like start thinking of it critically and assessing mm. it and like, what did I like? What did I not like? And then start looking at the behind the scenes mm. stuff and seeing how it was made. And I mean, granted, you're there for all that. Like, yeah. uh, I'm getting it secondhand. You're there and seeing it being made. But still, for, for whatever reason, I don't know, it just... Uh, just something I always, I was always excited to be scared. And uh, like we talked about earlier today, I'm always seeking out something that'll scare me because it's harder and harder to find now. We should come up to Panorama City. Yeah. We've got a lot of scary things happening <laughs> no, up apparently, there. Apparently, yeah. apparently. Oh my gosh. Is that no, the but most... I mean, don't you find, like, I just find just everything is terrifying. Like, I just don't, I mean, in some ways, Somebody asked me, why do you think people love horror so much? And I'm like, well, they can replace this horrible reality that we have to face like on a city street in yeah. L.A. for like this really controlled kind of artistic exactly. yeah. hor horrible reality that we can just focus on on our screen. But to me, it's it's just adding to the other horror. It's not like mutually exclusive. Like you can trade one for the other. It's like it adds an extra layer of horror to the horror that we already have to cope with like yeah. I, every day. I, I do think for me it like replaces it because yeah, there's lots of things going on in the world that uh, suck and make me sad and are horrifying, but horror movies have, if not those things, you know, usually it's a simpler kind of like black and white, good, bad, but even in the really good movies where, you know, there's it, it reflects real life, there's a beauty to it whether right. it's the cinematography or the performances or something. And yeah. it's like, oh, it's it's making something good out of that scariness as opposed to in the real world where it's just, it just sucks. There's nothing, yeah, the, the there's nothing good to take. the real world just sucks. Yeah, yeah, there's no well, silver lining. Well, that actually brings us to a really good point that we ask on this show all the time. And that is, what is your nightlight? And what we mean by that is like, in the midst of all of these terrible things, right? All of, you're saying like the real world is so scary and I don't want to add to it. 
what is the thing that keeps you from being so overwhelmed? Like even when you're going through something to, like you went through mm -hmm. today, that what is the light at the end of the tunnel when you wake up <sighs> from the nightmare? Well, I always, like whenever I have a really stressful day or I've seen like a lot of really, you know, heavy stuff during the day, funnily enough, I go home and I get into my kitchen and like I chop an onion, which <laughs> always makes me cry, right? <laughs> and I just start cooking it. Like it's like one of the first things I do when I get home is I just start cooking. I cook and it always has an onion in it usually because <laughs> for some reason, like just that process of just stop focusing on the outside world and just focus on just feeding myself and my, yeah. you know, my family has always been like this really calming thing. And I was at Thanksgiving dinner with, you know, my family and I asked one of my relatives, I said, so, you know, tell me about your life. Like, what do you do when you come home from work? You work so hard. And he's like, well, we order takeout and, and, you know, it comes and we sit in front of the TV and then I'm like, well, like, what do you do to unwind? Like, how do you get from working, working, working to relaxing? Like, isn't there like some, you know, wind down? He's like, oh, I take my dog for a walk or like, you know, these yeah. kinds of things. So um, my wind down is definitely cooking dinner. And um, I, I really like focus on my my family. I'll make sure like I touch base with everybody to yeah. know that they're OK and I'll, you know, look for pictures of my grandson on my, you know, yeah. on my phone. But I do try to just make it really, um, I try to make my world really small. Yeah. I basically, like, I don't want to let anybody else in. I just want to do something that's just, I can control 100%. Yeah. And that's kind of how I shut everything out. And I know yeah. that the minute I turn the TV on, it's going to be, like, something bad will be on right. it. Um, one of those drug commercials that I have nightmares about. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's it's something that it's kind of a meditation, I guess you would say. Yeah. You know, and I can and I don't ever follow recipes. Like I don't, <laughs> I just like throw stuff in a pan, yeah, and, and sometimes it it's happen. terrible, and sometimes it's good. But um, you can always make a pot of rice or something, you know, that everybody will eat. But yeah. I do feel like I just go really like local in my own little being, just you know. Just tend your own garden. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. tend my own garden for an hour and then <laughs> and then I kind of have like decompressed yes. and to be able to take so. care of That's why when I go on location it just drives me oh. absolutely yeah. nuts. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I if I if I have to stay in a hotel, I'm like cuz I always you can't do Yeah, cuz you can't do that. So yeah. I just have to just freak out and like I usually go you don't get or your walking like you'll see me walking around the hotel like People are like, who's that lady? Like, <laughs> we're just in Alabama. <laughs> and we were in this hotel that was like basically a roadside. Um, it was a nice, you know, Hampton Inn kind of a place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, I got to get out of here. Like, I, I've got to move around. And so it was so, there was nothing. And I was just like walking around <laughs> these like basically uh, construction sites, you know, just trying to get out of the hotel. But um yeah, I'm really tortured when I can't do my thing. Mm. For sure. It was a nightmare. That's my, that's my nightmare, <laughs> having yeah. to stay in a hotel without a kitchen. <laughs> so so then what, were you filming something that you can talk about? I that, think that I can in, say what okay. I did. I um, I played a, a part in Mike Flanagan's new film called Life of Chuck. Great. And oh. it's, uh, you know, based on Stephen King, three stories by Stephen King that the more I read, I mean, the, the, my script, which is so good, but the more I really think about the story, it is, it's kind of like a dream inside of a life, inside of a nightmare, inside of a, yeah. it, it, it incorporates like so many aspects of the subconscious mind that, as you can tell, like I'm really like trying to understand. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And Mike is so, um, you know, he's so deep. Actually, and um, you know, he makes movies that are—they're just like one level more. They, there's a lot of thinking, yeah. like they're—they're they're very cerebral in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Um, so I'm trying to like figure him out too, <laughs> and, and, and all the time. Like I'm like, what makes him tick? Like you well, know, you have to watch our podcast, and you got you got a little sneak peek of. Some I did, of it. Yeah. I did. I got to see the last part where you're doing the poem, and the words that he picked were definitely a clue into his soul <laughs> but it must be such an honor to be welcomed into his bidet his... like yeah. whoa no i'm just kidding <laughs> 
to to be welcomed into his uh you know a recurring cast now that you've yeah. been in well you don't know you're club. part of the recurring cast exactly. until you until get, you get a cast. second yeah. job right yeah. yeah so i was so fortunate to be in the midnight club mm-hmm. which um you know took us to canada and that was a really incredible experience but it was during covid so as i was i was telling him that there was so much frustration in not being able to really be with people and get to know yeah. people very well and and because of all the dis- restrictions that COVID presented. And then on this show, um, Life of Chuck, it was a different kind of barrier because he was having people just fly in for one day to do their part and then leave. It was oh. very, um, it, it wasn't the kind of thing where we all get flown to a place, we live there for yeah. a month and then we all leave. Yeah. Um, it was film. like I was yeah. there for one night or two nights and then the other person comes in and does their scene and yeah. then the other person comes in. Most of the scenes had few people. and. Yeah. Okay. So that was challenging because you knew that, you know, Tom Hiddleston was like working three days before you and yeah. you were never going to meet him. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, people that you were dying to like work watch with. them work yeah. or watch them do their scene. It wasn't like that. So I told him, I go, OK, now you owe me another one because I really want to <laughs> meet my co-stars and not have COVID like screens and shields and masks and all that. So. Maybe. Well, we're putting it out there. We're putting it out I there. I hope yeah. so. Next Third time. Third time's a charm I, I, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But he he has afforded me the opportunity to play so many great characters. And uh, this character in Life of Chuck is no exception. And she is, uh, you know, she's an older woman. So I told him, I, I'll lean into that. You know, I, I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see. I we're, well, we're so excited. Thank you so much for being here. You're with us. so we, welcome. We can't wait to check out Life of Chuck. Yeah. What what else uh, What else is coming up for you? Or where can anyone else find out more oh. about you and your own nightmares and your journey <laughs> through them? Well, last year, you know, was the first year where I played several parts. Like, you know, my career has been like a part this year, four years later, a part, oh. you know, four years. My career has been very, you know, spanned a lot of time. Oh between roles and this last year i have to you know knock on wood i had the chance to play several really great roles so not life of chuck of course that mm-hmm. was the most recent one and working for mike was just such a dream come true and then um i played a witch oh. in a movie called stalked that oh. is um being edited right now Wesley Malott is the director. Okay. But I've always, my first role that I ever played in my whole life was a witch when I was seven years old. Oh, <laughs> so I um, come full circle. Yeah, and I, I wore a green face and uh, like curly uh-huh. eyebrows and the whole thing when I was seven. And I remember looking at the mirror going, I love playing witches. Like, <laughs> <laughs> is it so, stocked like stocks? Like, is uh, that? Uh, no, it's, um, it takes place, stocks as in corn stocks. Okay, uh, all right. Yeah, and it's sure a, it like yeah, like a, kind of a haunted farm, okay. so I say. Um, at my witchy character, I said to the producer, I'm like, I'll definitely play your witch, but <laughs> David Leroy Anderson has to do the makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Did he? So he created this really great witch. Nice for me to wear and we got to go to New Jersey and shoot that at this really creepy, really scary uh, haunted farm oh, as far that, as I could tell. Was that with uh, Scout? Ted yeah, Pumpkin? with Scout. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Scout was on that. Yeah, yeah. so That's she great. was the um, heroine. Oh, amazing. Uh, and oh gosh, yeah, we had a really, really great scene together and okay. I hope it I hope it cuts together well. It was very, <laughs> very fun to do that scene. And then um, I got to play a part in uh, Chrissy Fox and Spider One's film yeah. Little but, Bites yeah. with yeah. my co-star here, James Janice, <laughs> and I'm super excited to see that movie. I hear it's finished. So okay, cool. Yeah, so we're gonna get to see that pretty soon, I think. Yeah, I can't wait. So those are the th- three things I did last year, and then I did a film last year called Plea that has been at all the festivals and been doing really, really well. And it's it's more of a thriller, mm-hmm. yeah. and I play the sister of a man who his wife was murdered and someone served time, but everyone knows that the guy who served the time didn't do it. And so the the brother is just tortured with this knowledge that the real killer is still out there. And he takes this drastic step to, um, you know, to try to make things right. And mm-hmm. I play a sister. So that was a really fun project. The, um, the director is um, Brian McQu- McCreary and he's, 
a director that's really up up and coming and his work is really good. I mean, it was done on a shoestring budget and it looks fantastic. So um, that's kind of what I did last year. And it's now I'm just waiting to see them all. You yeah. know, it's like it's well, we really that wait waiting time. Actor, when you have to yeah. wait. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so frustrating. Well, we'll for sure be looking out for them as well. I'm sure everybody else. Oh, thank, thank you. you. For being thank you so here much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This is so fun. <laughs> uh, until next time, uh, this has been Scream Dreams, the <laughs> nightmares that shaped us. If you liked what you listened to, because we forget to do it sometimes, please make sure you like, subscribe, follow there's something about a button there's that a i still bell. don't understand you ring the bell ring the bell yeah, yeah, yeah. Ring the bell. <laughs> yeah. it's like a little notification bell on youtube i oh. don't know yeah yeah it's like a little ring guy it. ring Just it ding 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 the bell mm-hmm. ding ding, ding the bell. Ding. <laughs> and uh we are scream dreams i'm katherine corcoran and i'm james a Janice. do you want to do the catchphrase uh yeah this is a <laughs> reminder to leave the lights on good okay <laughs> leave the nightlight on no no leave it We're good. See you later.